Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining Snowflake Office Hours with FAIR, a subscription model that lets consumers and gig economy drivers get a car on their phone and return it whenever they want. Today, I'm joined by Brandon Adams, Director of Analytics at FAIR, who will talk about his experience using Snowflake. Brandon will get into more details, but after migrating to Snowflake, FAIR can now access all of the data, enabling all their users to confidently make data-driven decisions in real time. And my name is Jeannie Liu. I'm a Product Marketing Manager at Snowflake. We'll hold all questions until the end of the session, but as always, please ask any and all questions throughout the duration of the webinar because no question is off limits. Brandon, without further ado, off to you. Hey guys, my name is Brandon. I um, am, the, am the Director of Analytics over at FAIR. Um, in charge of a centralized analytics team of both data warehousing engineers and a data analyst. Um, we support um, the entire organization from product to marketing to finance and treasury and operations. And um, we support both the end-to-end -end ETL side and data warehousing and ingestion all the way through the analysis, the dashboards, and ultimately um, the analytics that drive all affairs decision-making as a company. Um, without further ado, I'll um, continue on. So as uh, Zoe mentioned, um, FAIR, if you guys haven't heard of us yet, we're a subscription model in um, Santa Monica, and ultimately we are um, working on creating a better way to get a car all through your mobile device. Um, long story short, you're able to download the app um, shop and browse cars, check out, sign your contract, and get the car delivered to you all within the same day and with the flexibility to return the car whenever you want. So you can have a car for you know a week, a month, a year, um, as truly as long as you want, return the car, and have no strings attached. Um, with that being said, um, we have been around for about two years now, a little over two years now. Uh, we have had hyper growth um, just by the state of things. No one's really done. We have been accomplishing here as a company. Um, I'm not sure if you guys can see my slide I'm currently on. There we go. Um, ultimately, uh, we launched about two years ago. We have had over 70,000 customers through the app, millions of downloads, and ultimately are expanding throughout the US right now and um, doing a lot of really cool things um, on the data side and the analytics side and the data warehousing side that require um, a really modern uh, tool set to be able to accomplish what we are looking to ultimately do. And I'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, going on to the next slide, um, there might be a little bit of delay, just give it a second. Um, but ultimately, um, over the course of two years, our data journey here has been pretty um, expansive from where we started to where we are today. Ultimately, we started with a um, Presto uh, data warehouse that was great when we had uh, small to medium-sized data. Ultimately, we um, nowadays are piping in more than 40 million records a day, um, which requires um, a very elastic data warehouse that uh, can handle, for example, JSONs really well can handle across database joins really well, and ultimately um, has the flexibility that can to give us data in seconds rather than minutes or hours. Um, ultimately, I'm not going to go through this entire data journey, but um, where where we are right now is a combination of um, that middle section of Snowflake with Airflow, with Looker, um, and GitHub and CircleCI for version control and continuous deployment and automation. Um, and then ultimately we have Looker powering a lot of the um, self-service analytics for the organization as well. Uh, next slide. So while it loads, um, I'll just kind of give you guys an overview. So we're a very microservice environment here at FAIR, um, which means that we have probably close to 50, if not more, um, Postgres databases throughout our entire company, um, which requires and unfortunately, it requires um, a lot of cross database joins on the analytics side of things that um, obviously Postgres isn't set up to do by itself from a more analyst standpoint. 
Uh, we have other platforms like Salesforce and NetSuite and um, all these different disparate data sets that um, all work together on the back end side of things, but um, aren't in the same uh, monolithic data base on the uh, Postgres side. So obviously we have to find a solution that can handle um, close to, I would say, 500 tables and data sources and give us the flexibility to really be able to query millions or billions of records um, extremely quickly and um, provide our uh, very um, tech savvy and um, growing organization with real-time analytics based on their requirements. So this is what two years ago looked like. It's actually a lot more crazy, but I wanted to simplify it for just the slide. Um, moving on to the next slide, um, we've really been able to leverage some of these more modern tools like Snowflake, for example, to be able to handle these really large data ingestions and um, transformations and ultimately um, be able to give us the flexibility to give different teams the bandwidth and the power they need. So if data science needs a large um, instance, we're able to support them. If Looker needs a small instance, we're able to support that. And ultimately, um, we're able to spin up and down these warehouses in a matter of seconds rather than um, take you know weeks or longer potentially on um, DBA migrations and um, a lot of the more manual processes that have um, in the past anyways slowed down data warehouse development and um, ETL. Going on to the next slide, um, just highlighting again a little bit about our craziness in terms of who we support. So um, we work very closely with the production engineers um, across our uh, inventory side and pricing and um, our asset management and transportation layer and ultimately um, finance counting, et cetera, and so forth, operations. Again, this is kind of um, a truncated version, but um, as you can see, we also have marketing tools like Braze and AppsFlyer for mobile attribution and brands for deep linking. And ultimately, um, we power a lot of that through and particle data as well as a customer data platform. Um, we have a lot of S3 files that we get pushed up every day that we have to ingest into Snowflake. Um, Salesforce is an example. Ultimately, um, we have all that going into um, an ETL tool of ours. And then ultimately, we have hourly uh, transformation jobs running that um, house and um, continually update our star schema um, that currently involves about two to three fact tables and close to 15 dimensions that um, another requirement that we had was create everything in uh, a real-time instance and having a star schema constantly update every hour um, with transformed and highly curated data sets is as close as real-time that we possibly have gotten and then ultimately the raw tables go into Snowflake. About 500 raw tables get updated every couple minutes using our ETL. So if users need access to the raw file for real-time analytics, they can um, hit Snowflake and um, parse, run, analyze real-time data as it comes in as well, which is really great for some of the operations teams that we have um, here at FAIR. Going on to the next slide, um, <clears throat> I'll only spend a second on this one, but ultimately, um, Looker is outpowering our visualization layer. We have, at any given day, probably a couple hundred users in Looker at all given times running um, schedule jobs, alerts, um, analytics on their operations, as you can see. And Looker is sitting on top of Snowflake. And even just in the Looker warehouse alone, um, we have had over 500,000 queries run and ultimately um, in my opinion, no one's ever complained about Looker performance because of Snowflake and um, any dashboard, any look, any explorer runs within seconds. And um, when you have the kind of data that we have at this moment with billions of records in some tables, um, it's definitely no easy feat, especially because a lot of these ones also have very nested JSONs that we need to always parse out and um, transform as well. On to Snowflake, this is about a month old, so I'm sure it's even crazier now, but um, as of when I pulled this up, we had about 50 terabytes, if not more, stored in our Snowflake instance um, with our ETL jobs and everything else running to um, pipe data in. We've had, whenever I look at our history, about 50 to 100 queries running concurrently every minute. 
um, if not more at this point. Um, as I mentioned, real-time data pipelines, we have five quote-unquote databases in Snowflake, but within that we have at least 20 schemas, probably closer to 50 at this point with all of our um, staging schemas and um, microservice databases that we're piping in, 500 plus different tables and data sources, and the best part that we, like our team is really small here um, on the data warehousing side, we have two, maybe three people, um, pretty much managing most of the data warehouse and ETL processes, and uh, I would say less than 10% of the job is maintenance. Um, if that, I would say maintenance is pretty much just provisioning people at this point. At that point, we're able to automatically scale up or down instances within a couple seconds, and um, there's really not much on the DBA side that we ever have to do, which is awesome given the fact that our bandwidth is um, doesn't really have any room for DBA maintenance at this point. <laughs> um, so here's just some of our roadmaps that we're looking into. A lot of it involves um, working more with Snowflake. Um, so we've done a lot of the ETL already, um, piping stuff in, um, but we have new data sources coming up all the time, whether again, it's from new marketing data sources, accounting, finance, product, et cetera. Uh, we want to continue to build out our source schema um, our start schema has um, allowed the entire company, for the most part, to get onto one single source of truth. Um, I know for small companies that like to move extremely fast or large companies who um, just have a bunch of legacy systems in place that can't fully move over to one source of truth, um, it definitely costs, just from my experience and previous companies, millions if not more of just raw cash coming out every day or every month due to the fact that different teams are reporting different values. So. Um, one of our goals in the next couple of months is to continue to build out our star schema. And if anyone is on a raw production data set, to get them off of that and ultimately move whatever they need to into uh, the star schema. Uh, we're trying to explore new transformation tools as well um, as part of our roadmap. And then ultimately, on the business side, everything we're doing is currently to build out um, better unit economics, payment performance, LTV, um, customer, and uh, vehicle. Um, lifetime value and ultimately growth so that we can continue to grow at this hyper growth speed that we've been um, been doing the last couple of years. Um, and again, we as a team like to have retrospectives every couple of weeks, ideally, um, and a couple of them um, that we kind of just gathered here. Step one, uh, this whole new concept of data ops, um, which is kind of like a data DevOps thing is um, very much important. Um, we're able to maintain our velocity of probably merging in anywhere from 10 to 20 changes in our star schema in any given week or any given sprint um, due to the fact that we've automated a lot of the manual deployments that most teams have um, historically in data warehousing. Um, project management and task management through JIRA is, um, or through any tool that you want to have uh, uh, project management in is crucial in our opinion. Um, when we had a smaller team of like three or four people, we were able to manage it by ourselves, but with a team of give or take 10, um, making sure that you can communicate with your stakeholders has been um, extremely effective for us. Um, again, everything's managed through GitHub and CircleCI uh, for integration. Um, Looker training has been extremely valuable, including Snowflake training as well for more of the power users in our company. Um, and then ultimately, uh, the other kind of retrospectives are more on the looker and um, analytics side of things. But um, for us, having a very version controlled environment um, has helped us move really quickly and maintain um, integrity, especially when uh, we have probably 20 different engineering teams releasing anything at any given time um, by week. It becomes um, an interesting environment to handle on the data warehousing side when data warehouses in a typical environment aren't as, um, <clears throat> what's it called, um, prioritized in startups. We've been able to um, make sure that the data warehouse has been one of the most um, prioritized teams here at FAIR. And that's why I think um, the entire company's had access to analytics in such a way that they've had for the last two years. Um, with that being said, uh, that's my LinkedIn and um, my email if anyone wants to contact me. 
and then ultimately um, open to questions. Great, thanks, Brandon, and thanks for that presentation. So I've done my to categorize uh, the questions that have come in, and I've noticed that a lot of the questions are coming in for slide nine, which is the data architecture, and slide 11, which is uh, no flakes used in here. So let's go into slide nine here. There's a couple of questions around star schema. You've already addressed it, but just to be sure, uh, the question was, around are you modeling your data warehouse in a traditional star schema and the follow-on and how does that perform in snow sure um yes uh well first um let me just step back and um i have one of my lead um data warehousing engineers with me as well um murray who's next main case um there's any questions that you might want to pass off to him but yes we are uh, modeling our data warehouse in a star schema format. Um, currently we have, uh, I think I mentioned it, but about 10 to 15 dimension tables, both uh, type one and type two at the moment. Um, and we have a fact table that's um, very traditional in terms of um, surrogate keys linking to all the dimension tables and um, that updates every hour during our airflow um, transformation jobs as they run. Um, which currently find deltas over the last three days and then merge them into the dimension tables. And then ultimately the fact table will have inserts um, as appropriate as the um, transformation tables run. Excellent. And I think you had mentioned a metric before, which is 500 raw tables get updated every couple of minutes. So that, that goes to the sheer speed as well as the scale that you're working with. Another question related to slide nine, which is the data architecture is Aluma. Sure. So uh, one of the things that this individual is asking is, uh, have there been any changes since the acquisition by Google? Uh, and ultimately, are you looking to migrate to a different ETL tool? Um, yeah, great question. Um, so I would say that um, since the acquisition, um, there haven't been new features that have been built out, but overall, um, our current ETL processes and data that we're piping in, and again, we're piping in about 40 million records a day. Um, we haven't seen many um, delays, at least recently. Um, if we have, it's partially because of potentially our SSH tunnels on our end, but um, we do, um, obviously, we have, um, as you can see here, quite a bit of um, data sources that we want to pipe in from more of the some of the marketing tech stuff as well as Salesforce and um, Stripe, which isn't here right now. But ultimately, we are looking to complement um, our ETL tool that we Aluma right now with um, another tool that might have more uh, connectors and ultimately is scaling out. Um, if we were on Google or GCP, I would say that. Um, we probably just stay with the Luma altogether, but um, ultimately we are looking for um, another tool that can support us as we scale and um, have the same kind of vision as we do in terms of um, growth. Excellent, thanks, Brandon. So one more question before we zoom out on your architecture. Sure. This in particular is about data modeling. So are you guys using any data modeling tools and how well do they support Snowflake? Um, data modeling tools like DBT or more like um, Informatica. Ultimately, right now we um, we aren't using any data modeling tools. I don't, I don't know if they were mentioning like Informatica or Matillion or something like that. Um, our current process is like Aluma, Fivetran, Airflow, and then ultimately uh, Snowflake. Um, we are looking into DBT that I think was on the previous slide um, for more of the transformation layer as well. Um, it hasn't been as high of a priority just because uh, we've built out an internal um, transformation tool in-house that really, um, in my opinion, empowers analysts to do um, an amazing effort in terms of being able to kind of be a pseudo data engineer as well. Um, just a little high level about our process there. Um, so everyone has to clone our GitHub repo for um, our fair 
analytics, um, Snowflake and uh, repo. From there, you make any kind of modifications to the dim tables or back tables. Um, you push that back up to GitHub uh, or to GitHub, yeah. And a uh, circle job kicks off to create a new staging environment um, in Snowflake. So it does a zero copy clone, built the entire data warehouse uh, schema um, in a kind of circle environment. Um, with that, once we've done a couple more testing and um, well, once a test run and once we do some manual checks, we can merge into GitHub and ultimately that um, kicks off another circle job that runs a, um, a swap and merge into our master instance. So everything's really been very much automated from a data DevOps side of things. And um, from there, we haven't had to kind of like build any tools that kind of do that for us, or we haven't had to use any tools for that. And then ultimately with data modeling, um, myself and uh, Mary next to me, um, and a couple of our other teammates as well um, are pretty fluent on dimensional modeling. So um, whenever a new job comes or a new table or new design comes in, we're able to kind of model that um, ourselves and then ultimately kick off another process to um, merge those new dimensional back tables into the data warehouse um, off the bat. So long story short, no, but um, I'm always open to new tools if it makes my job easier. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's shift gears and go to slide 11, which is Snowflake at FAIR. And uh, I'll, I'll take this uh, metric and then introduce the second question, the, the first question of this series. So you sure. mentioned that less than 10% is dedicated to maintenance. So you guys really are in hyper growth mode and a lot of the workforce that you have cannot be spent maintaining and tuning a warehouse, which was really interesting and, and uh, good to see. This question in particular talks about the development staff. So how long did it take for those people to get up to speed on Snowflake? Um, so the last part was how long does it take other people to get caught up on Snowflake? Um, in terms of like Where's my our, our developers? Um, yeah, I mean, our, uh, on our team, um, a lot of people were coming from, I don't know, Redshift or another um, cloud data warehouse. So. Um, getting caught up on Snowflake's, um, uh, what's it called, uh, language, SQL language was very straightforward. Um, most of us were coming from Postgres as well. And in my opinion, um, Postgres and Snowflake's uh, logic was very similar. Uh, if you're coming from more of like a Hive background, maybe it would be a little bit different or um, maybe Oracle would be a little different. But ultimately, the SQL syntax is in my opinion, one of the easiest ones we've ever, ever had to pick up. <coughs> and um, especially with like, if you get into like JSON parsing or um, anything that's like correlated subqueries or anything, or like uh, CTEs or um, exist clauses or anything like that, that's a little bit more advanced. Um, stuff like handles all that really well. And uh, we haven't really run into a, an instance that Snowflake couldn't handle. Um, Array parsing as well. Um, yeah, I mean, some of our logic is pretty complex because we're doing everything off of our production um, tables that are coming from Postgres. So we've pretty much seen it all here in terms of extremely deeply nested JSONs, connecting with Python, for example, um, any kind of part. I pretty much we've seen it all here, and um, Snowflake's been able to handle um, anything that we've needed really well. And even with our millions or billions of lines of records of tables, um, all of our transformation jobs are able to run on um, still a small instance in <coughs> usually about a half an hour um, max. And we haven't even, there's a lot of optimization we can do in terms of limiting CTEs to a certain time range and limiting our Delta jobs and limiting the number of tests we run. Um, we haven't really optimized as much as I'd like to. And if we did, um, we would definitely see, you know, these hourly jobs, in my opinion, run in probably like 10 or 15 minutes, and that's still on a very small um, warehouse size and Snowflake as well. Does that answer Excellent. that? <laughs> that's great. Uh, and then two more questions with Snowflake at FAIR, and then let's get into FAIR. So this question is specifically about the data comes from a lot of places. So sure. how does security work? security for data in transit and data in use? 
Um, sure, I'll try to answer. So security in general here, um, our security team has been with us. So I've been here for about three and a half years. Um, our Most of our security team um, and our CTO actually here started in the security and platform team as well here. Um, and ultimately, um, security has been kind of in like a lockdown since day one. Um, I would say that like, anything in our pr uh, production databases in Postgres, for example, even things that might not typically be PII, like, um, like I don't know, maybe some companies say like last name or, or like address is in PII, but for us, first name, last name, address, date of birth, SSN, everything's encrypted. Um, even before it gets anywhere near the data warehouse, um, ultimately, and then ultimately with Illuma and Fivetran, we've signed um, contracts that require um, a little bit more security protocol on their end as well. Um, we have Okta set up in Snowflake as well. So whenever we provision new accounts and do quote unquote some of the DBA work, um, everyone has Okta signed up. So um, no one's getting in without that. Um, and I mean, between those three things, I mean, our warehouse is pretty much like locked down in terms of PII, 99.999%. Um, and if there's ever a time when we do need to put any PII in, if we if we ever did need to, um, we would most likely create a new, very secure warehouse in Snowflake that has very limited credentials to the outside users, meaning that none of the Looker users can use it, none of our normal users can use it, and we would only be using it for very specific purposes um, if we had to go down that route. But um, for me, in an ideal world, if you need PII, it should probably be coming from like an internal tool, um, whether that's like a Salesforce instance or an internal like an internal like CRM tool that you might have in house. And I mean, we're doing analytics here. Um, usually, analytics doesn't require, in my opinion, PII. So I try to keep as much of that out of the warehouse or the analytics platforms as possible. Excellent. So we'll round it up with this uh, final question about Snowflake. Uh, a lot of questions pertain. So, as everyone on the line knows, we pay. We only pay for the storage and compute that you actually use. And so, this question in particular was: How do you actually predict what your cost is going to be at the at the end of every month? And uh, the follow-on is: Does the amount of query growth impact how much you're going to be using Snowflake? Uh, sure. Um... So in terms of predicting growth, um, we've, for the most part, we are able to pretty accurately tell, um, Snowflake also follows up with us quite often, lets us know our usage rates um, and forecasted rates, just, um, just in case we're about to go over. But um, we can kind of see, so like our Illumina or ETL platforms are pretty consistent month over month. Um, Aluma, for example, is streaming in pretty much 24 hours a day. So um, unless we have some crazy backfills that we need to do, that would require us to go from 40 million records a day to a billion records over a day. Um, typically, that's pretty um, streamlined. Uh, we can see our Looker warehouse's growth um, increase, and we can kind of just forecast based on uh, historicals at this point. Um, there is definitely some... Uh, some changes with our like Circle CI instant uh, warehouse and um, our just like internal use just as company growth happens, but we're able to pretty um, I wouldn't say pretty easily, but pretty accurately forecast overall um, our growth and our our Snowflake instance is still for the entire year cheaper than one data engineer. So. Um, um, pretty easy argument to make, especially when we have all this stuff happening in um, a cloud warehouse to say, hey, like, if we need to have more budgets, fine, it's still cheaper than a data warehouse engineer. So um, in my opinion, <laughs> if you compare building a warehouse by yourself versus doing everything we're doing here, um, it's kind of a no-brainer. Excellent. Thanks, Brandon. Let's shift gears for a final time and talk about FAIR. So there's a lot of interesting questions that came in specifically about your business model. And okay. I wanted to ask you this. Uh, so your organization is currently in hyper-growth mode. Uh, you definitely want to use 
better ROI models to see how to learn more about your customers, uh, what drives retention in LTV. So this question is, can you talk about how you work with your marketing team via M particle stories, et cetera, to use your data models for prospecting for new customers? Sure. Um, happy to chat about that. So uh, we pair really closely with marketing and performance marketing teams here. Um, back on the other slide, uh, so we're a mobile first platform. Um, so from day one, we've had AppsFlyer, we've had Branch, we've had um, MParticle, Amplitude, all the like marketing product growth tools that we needed to have. Um, ultimately, a lot of things that we are doing on the um, analytics side of things, it's, eh, where do I start? So um, high level, uh, we're ingesting all these different tools and building out performance marketing tables um, for them that kind of show them um, across any campaign, any channel, um, any platform, um, by day, by install day, um, how much is it costing us to acquire a customer, um, whether that's cost per subscription or pre-approval or order or account, um, we're able to um, slice that by um, the hundreds of campaigns that they've had and ultimately help them analyze and understand um, how much they're spending and how much that's actually, how much the spend is driving involved on Google, Facebook, uh, Twitter, et cetera. Um, in one centralized um, table that they're able to uh, use in Looker and ultimately run and see all the historical trends and um, analytics. Um, on more of like an M-particle front or a CDP front, um, we're also in charge of all of the events that we have, so all the mobile events of um, any action they perform, any kind of um, screen they view, any button they tap, um, anytime they create an order, we're in charge of both the back-end events that are piping in through M-particle and the front-end events that are happening uh, through M-particle. So, um, that ultimately gets um, sent over into MParticle and ultimately into Snowflake, as well as pushed back out into Amplitude and Facebook and uh, we're able to embrace and all these other uh, MarTech tools that we've helped integrate as well. And um, yeah, we're kind of powering both the data and ultimately the, um, the strategy around how um, everything is used here. I hope that answers that question. Uh, we can definitely go in a little bit more, but um, the LTV, the, all the customer LTV, asset level LTV models, um, subscription level LTV models are coming through and getting, getting built out, whether it's from my team or the marketing team or the data science team around um, the data that we're getting in through all these different sources and ultimately pushing back out into a variety of these tools to help us um, gain new uh, customer growth. And um, I would say that Snowflake and Particle have been huge drivers of that since. Uh, Stay one. Excellent. So this question is also about fair. So uh, geospatial is a hot topic. Are you guys doing any geospatial analytics? Uh, and how are you, if not, how are you filling that gap? What are some extensions that you're using that work well with Snowflake? Yeah, I've actually, so we have looked into um, Geospatial, we've actually asked this a couple of times. We want to, a lot of times we have like lat long and we have IP addresses and ultimately we're trying to target um, users a little bit better in terms of understanding. Um, for example, our flow goes from install to creating an account, to creating an application, to getting an order and ultimately getting a car. Um, there's times in the app where we don't know where a customer is just because they haven't made it through that step of telling us where their address is yet. Um, and ultimately, we want to kind of, especially on like the marketing, performance marketing side, we want to know, um, are they actually um, in LA or how, how's our, how's our CAC, how's our LTV, um, how's our CAC doing in, or how's our um, performance doing in any one of these steps? Um, so from there, we use IP address quite often actually to um, identify where these users are. Um, that uh, has been kind of tricky when we don't like, IP address or like, Wi-Fi address area isn't really ideal for a lot of these um, things, but um, we have a couple of different sources to kind of help us narrow that down. And I would say within the 90% accuracy, understand um, where the customer is. Um, I believe I could be wrong, but I think Snowflake's actually building out some functions to help um, as an IP address like lookup, but I don't want to kind of, I'm, I think they are. Um, but even without that, um, MParticle, AppsFlyer, some of these other tools are have IP addresses, and there's easy to look up tables 
online that kind of look up an IP address to a zip code, and from there we can map it to a DMA and ultimately um, get pretty good coverage. Um, there's other tools. This is more like a marketing, like a MarTech question. There's um, a couple tool, of one tool in particular that we've been looking into more that um, can help us actually do a lot of geofencing really well um, based on where a customer is. It wouldn't be more on like a data warehousing analytics question, more of a can we like target people who are maybe on current block and send out a push notification or um, some kind of messaging around them? And we have been looking into those tools and they integrate really well with M Particle and Braze as well. So um, I'm not sure if I can just like give out names over this, but there's definitely tools that can help with geospatial um, um, customer segmenting and targeting. Yeah, absolutely, Brandon. So it's not a secret, and it is on the roadmap. So we are looking at basically supporting the functionality up front for geo will um, obviously over time improve the performance. So that is on the roadmap. The final question I have in the fair space is around change data capture. Um, so this question in particular is, uh, how do you actually take care of it? Is it through Aluma? And if so, how has the performance been for you? Yeah, um, so um, again, all of our Postgres tables were, I think 99% of them were on CDC for um, all of our tables that we're ingesting. Um, and I would say that as long as your table is quote unquote like a normal table with a primary key and a date field, um, CDC has worked really well for us. Um, and ultimately, we don't have many deletions in our databases, but uh, I would say that half of our database, because we're very microservice, every team is a little different out there. Some of their Postgres databases are only insert only, um, which is great for us. Some of them, a lot of them actually are um, actually updates, which require CDC. Um, since I've been here since day one, um, very early on, I basically caught any tables that don't have like a versions table that they update. And we um, make sure that the engineering team here creates a version table for every table that's updated. So with um, any of our Ruby um, teams, we'll make sure that they use paper trail for this. Um, our Python teams have been pretty good with only inserts only or historical tracking tables. But um, either way, just in case, we have CDC set up for every table. And again, we have about 40 million records coming in every day. Sometimes that's up to 60 to 100 million records a day. Uh, we don't really ever see a lag. Um, with Aluma, they have um, dashboards that show us if there is latency, there's you know, restream queues as well, so we know that if any data is coming in um, that isn't accurate, it gets stored there, and ultimately we can restream it in. But um, CDC has worked really well for us. And again, some of our teams, especially operations, they track like intraday how many, if we're buying tens of thousands of cars, um, and there, we're transporting them through like an asset lifecycle. We need to know where the cars are, how many of them need maintenance at any given time, how many of them are ready for a customer, how many of them need oil changes, tire rotations, et cetera, and so forth. And ultimately, um, a lot of our operations teams um, use Looker and our Snowflake data in pretty much real time. So CDC has been, um, without, without CDC, it would have been really hard to do that. Um, and it's worked really well for us. That's great, Brandon. We have still a ton of questions, uh, but we do need to end the series. A couple of things that um, that will happen: everyone on the on the line will get the recording and the slide deck, and the questions will be answered. So somebody from Snowflake will reach out to you. The next office hours. Is Week, so we're looking forward to having everyone join as well. And Brandon, specifically for FAIR, Snowflake is really bullish on the global mobility market, and we're excited to see what you guys do with or we even without Snowflake. So thanks again for joining, and thanks again, Brandon. Have a great day, everybody. Goodbye.